Now it's been more than one week since terrorists attacked an Abuja Kaduna bound train, killing about eight persons and kidnapped scores. The terrorists first used explosives to mob immobilize the train before shooting at passengers. The Nigeria Railway Corporation says its manifest shows that 362 passengers boarded the train, and while eight were killed, a total of 186 have been confirmed to be safe, while 168 are yet to be accounted for. Nigerians are now calling for better security and around train stations, especially in a troubled northwest region. With me in the studio is a security consultant, Darlington Umaru, who is joining me. Thank you so much for being on TVC Breakfast this morning. My pleasure, always. Right. Good morning. Right. And joining me via Zoom is private security and defense consultant, Group Captain Sadiq uh, she uh, Thank you so much for being here. Morning. Let me start with you, Vazum, uh, Group Captain Sadiq Shehu. Well, they say, there's a term we use in journalism, especially in broadcast, that if it leads, it bleeds. Talking about giving priority to priority to uh, violence and other stories that are happening. But don't you think we are bleeding too much in this country? Well, uh, it is really unfortunate that despite uh, the efforts of our security forces and the government, it is looking as if... Uh, you know, the required effort is not yet uh, at par with the challenges we are facing. Uh, after the, you know, very spectacular and sad news of the attack on the train, again, uh, the days following, we see the bandits again attacking. Not only attacking innocent civilians, but sometimes, like we see in the Berlinguari incident, even taking the fight for our security forces. So what does that mean? It means we cannot talk too much about security. Because without security, you don't have anything. We still have to talk. All stakeholders have to engage. Both those in government and those outside government and those in private sector, we have to put hands together and ideas. And then we have to look at, since we are getting the same results of these people still attacking, it means there is something we are doing wrong. We have to review our review. After every attack, if we cannot stop it, there must be lessons that will be drawn. Is it the train attack? There are a lot of lessons. Is it the attack now on of our indigenous worry of our soldiers underestimating the strength of uh, the bandits and then being overwhelmed? There are a lot of lessons to talk. So, uh, unfortunately, while we would like to talk of other things, what is showing is that uh, security, security will have to be, dominate our discussion and probably maybe even after this uh, present government. So, uh, whoever has a stake in the Nigerian project must actually look at security. A holistic approach to our security activity. Certainly, there is no longer any denying that the security we have on the ground is not fit for purpose. Well, uh, when you look at generally, again, I always like to say the security is like a tale of two battlefields. Uh, it cannot be taken, uh, I mean, it cannot be denied yeah. that when you look at the Northeast, that is the, uh, the fight against Boko Haram, successes are there uh, for the first time. That is, in my opinion, we are seeing our forces actually entering into the enclave, the dreaded Zambiza forest. We have our soldiers there to me for right. the first time. That is uh, this thing. Numbers are going down. However, as we are gaining the upper hand in the Northeast, unfortunately, it is the Northwest, again, that is uh, proving a challenge. So uh, maybe, like I continue to see, maybe we don't have enough hands. It is not even maybe. It is clear we don't have enough hands. We do not have enough soldiers. We do not have enough policemen to cover. People will say it is not them, but certainly numbers are there. I will give an example of numbers. I see people saying that how many are the bandits, how many are armed forces. But people that make this uh, kind of argument, they, you know, they ignore the concept of irregular or asymmetric warfare. A bandit needs only 15 people sporadically firing to dislodge a village of 5,000 people. Only 15 of them can do that once as well. However, if the military or the police want to defend that same village, we are not coming with 15 people. We are not coming with 30 people. We are coming almost with a battalion or at least two companies. That's about 600 people. So when people are talking about numbers, it is not a direct correlation that you know, uh, bandits are 10, so you need 10 soldiers. No, it is not like that. Because the work of the bandit is just to destroy, to scatter people. All right, um, 15 people. Group, group Captain Sadiq, uh, Sadiq Shell, uh, just hang on. Let me let me try to bring in um, Dali tomorrow right here in the studio. Uh, we'll definitely get back to that line of thought that you're sharing but then 22 villagers were said to have been kidnapped just right immediately almost 24 hours after the igp you know went across that road and declared the, the road very safe um i'm not sure what came to your mind when you first when you first saw that story 
Well, we were here uh, la uh, last week when we, we discussed uh, the issue of uh, the airport attack. Yeah. And I did make a statement and I said, there's something behind it. What is the thinking of the terrorists going to invade the airport in Kaduna? It became very glaring uh, just that same day. Apparently, the strategy was clear and simple. Now, the corridor the, between Kaduna and Abuja yeah. had been the, 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 the key point where they wait for unsuspected commuters. The train, the railway came, and then the airport, and then the use of that corridor became very, very minimal. Yeah. And apparently, the thinking by these terrorists was, how do we bring back traffic to this corridor, apparently? Most people now fly through the airport, and more people fly, more people travel by rail, the train. Mm. And now they went to the airport, discouraged users. The, the next day, or two days after, they bombed the rails to discourage commuters from using the train. Mm. And then so that the rush will return to the road. And then that is, was exactly what you find. And just after the, ro the rail was bombed, I think the next day, they kidnapped people on that road. The IG going to declare the roads free was not enough. How, what have you put in place to say this road would now be free? Have you been able to, were you able to put technology in place to monitor the movement of sus sus suspected persons the answer was the answer is apparently no. Now, the Abuja corridor, the Abuja Kaduna corridor, is what has been, what the bandits have been using that place for over time. It's not new. I I expected that security agencies by now would have been able to phantom, you know, specific strategy to monitor that road. Recently, when all of this happened. Some of the governors started talking about uh, how to get drones yeah. to monitor the activities of this person. We have cried, we have said it, we have mentioned it over and over. The other day I said it here. I said, what do security, what, what, does, uh, what do the governors do with their security votes? What do they do with their security votes? They say security agencies are not in the hands or control of the governors. Can the governors provide equipment that can help Intel and um, and uh, surveillance, can't they? Now they are beginning to do. If you if you go to the social media, you will find one of uh, one of the clips where a drone that was deployed into the forest caught some of these bandits where they gathered and were cooking, cooking. and one was even pointing gun at it. And so it is a very simple thing. It Look, we cannot continue to sound like broken records over and over and over again. The point we have gotten to now is st solution. Technology has to be deployed if this war must be won. These people have declared war, and we have to, like he said just now, he says that it looks, it, the, the activities of these persons is making the response of the military and the government look as if nothing is happening, that they are not doing anything. Is that really the truth? They are working, but... Uh, what, whatever they are doing, are, are we really getting the result? Are we really feeling the impact? Right. The, 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 the terrorists are taking us headlong. Yeah. And then at each point in time, they show to the country, they tell the government that no, we are on top of the game. All right. Uh, let me go to uh, uh, Group Captain Sadiq Shehu. Well, Nigerian soldiers have been praised for their exploits, you know, what they you know, the expert they make internationally and all that. But some are of the opinion that they are not actually trained to fight insurgency within, that it's very easy for them to do that outside, but within, they are not exactly trained. Why does it look like it's a mirage to, you know, stop these people in their tracks? Thank you very much. I like talking frankly and honestly based on what I know of the military. Definitely, Nigeria in the days of Ekomo in Sierra Leone and uh, Liberia, we received accolades. But when people bring these comparisons, we are talking about the past, about the future. The honest truth is that the armed forces we had that fought in Liberia and Sierra Leone is not the same armed forces we're having today. 
also has changed. Even the entrance into the military has changed. The uh, support by the government has changed. When you look at the uh, at the defense spending or recruitment or equipping, the truth is that uh, since after the Ecomog exploit, where we really you know shown like uh, like stars, attention has not been given over the military over the years. The same thing with the police, you know. So we have been there thinking that uh, we were good, but this, this situation on the ground is not the same thing. The, fa the, the facts are there on the ground. So definitely we left our military on utile. I always say the military or the police, any security agency, is like uh, a fire vehicle. You might find, you might, you might, you might, you might think buying a fire vehicle is very expensive. You might think you may, you may buy a fire vehicle and then for 10 years there is no fire, so people might see it as a waste of money. But the truth is that a wise man will keep a fire vehicle active, service, and fuel. Because the day the fire comes, it is not that day that you go and look for a place tender for buying a fire vehicle, for servicing it for this. It's the same thing with the military. You have to keep your fighting equipment sharp. Whether there are space or there is no, we didn't do that. Both the Boko Haram insurgency and the, and the, and the, and the bandit attack actually found our military at a very low capacity level. In terms of cost. Sorry, let me quickly put in. You shouldn't we, we? We've got the to, uh, the Tucano fighter jets, you know, for crying out loud. Why, why have we not de deployed it? Well, again, that is a legal and contractual issue. When we bought the Tucano, people forget that when we started uh, looking for the Tucano, it was around 2014. That was when we started you know, negotiating for the Tucano. Uh, we did not, or I can say the policymakers did not foresee that issues of banditry were going to come in. It was 2014. It was ongoing, stopped by this regime, started by this regime until we finally got them. Now, in arriving at the contract for the Tucano, we agreed with the Americans. Probably they had, uh, you know, they had people that think further than our own people. They insisted in the contract which you agreed to sign that we will only use this Tucano for counter insurgency, for fighting terrorism. That is what we signed. To be honest, there is nothing new in that contract. So definitely, if it is a mistake, we made it. And again, like I said, there are always lessons to be learned. That is what we signed. So as far as the Americans are concerned, good or bad, whether we like it or not, they do not agree we use the equipment we purchased from them for to fight uh, the bandits. And that is what we signed for. So I think people should have, I, I find this, uh, that even the legislators don't seem to understand that. When they declared bandit terrorists, they just said, okay, go and use the canoe. It is not as easy as that. There's a contractual agreement. And unfortunately, there is punishment we could pay if we decide to use the canoe. Having even said that, the Tucanos, are they even the best equipment you can use against bandits? I do not think so. Because when you are saying about, about, about the Tucanos, they are very powerful aircraft. But we are forgetting that this, okay, now the bandits that attacked uh, Berlinguari uh -huh. just yesterday. Are you telling me you are going to level uh, Berlinguari with, uh, with canoes? If, for example, you are even going to use them. So for every target, there is target and weapon match. Right. There is one that you can use the camera. There is one that you can use the camera. So please, let's leave the camera aside as far as the bandits are concerned. As look at other issues of how we can confront the bandits, which mm. we are not doing properly now. I think it's exactly. Right. I will okay. say before you stop me on the other hand, we are gaining upper hand in the Northeast, but unfortunately, do not go this way. But it is still the same troops that are using in the Northeast. It's still some troops. If they attack me, uh, they don't worry. You move them from point A to point B. Point A becomes uh, open. Right. You move them from point B to point C. You just, and again, like I, I, I emphasize, people that are saying we have numbers, we do not have numbers. We do not have enough numbers, even though that is only one index. You also need training. You also need equipment. But we do not have numbers. Don't compare the numbers of few bandits or few Boko Haram to say that uh, Nigeria has 100 or 50 or 200. It's not like that. All right, all right, good like captain. The good, capacity good, for good the captain, we'll, we'll come back to you. We'll, let me bring it back to the studio. You know, he also pointed to the fact that we need to look for, explore other options for us to be able to defeat this banditry. But do you think one of the reasons we're finding it very difficult to defeat this terrorism is because we ourselves, our own selves, we are divided along religious, ethnic, tribal sentiments and all that. And then we need to be united as a single people to, to face this issue head on. So, um... What do you think is needed to galvanize ourselves in order to face this monster? The biggest thing is to fight in, uh, infiltration. Have you been able to conquer infiltration? How do you mean? Infiltration where you have uh, members of uh, terrorists uh, being uh, part of 
uh, 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 the decision makers. Uh, Jonathan, you remember in his era when he did say that his government was infiltrated by uh, Boko Haram members? Uh, you remember when the Chibok guests were taken? When America came at a point in time when they, they, they carried that surveillance and they were to gas up that uh, aspect of the camp of the terrorists on, on Sambisa, what did they discover the day they went on surveillance? Just after that decision was taken, they discovered that when they went around, they discovered that the terrorists were wearing gas masks when they were to gas up that area. So how should we be, uh, how are we going conquer, to, to Conquer do this? infiltration, all of that. You also remember the case of the NIS and the DSS in December when a terrorist was to come in to invade Abuja. What happened? The DSS had the profiling. They handed it over to the NIS. The NIS did a memo, which they sent to their land commanders. That memo leaked. And what happened? So who does the conquering? Is it the people or the government? Government has to do more than they are doing now. You see, we have to be sincere with ourselves that we really want to fight terrorism in Nigeria. We have to be sincere. And then the moment, it's not about the soldiers. It's, well, part of it is the soldiers. Another is the equipment. Whether they have the right equipment to actually prosecute the war at each point. Just like he said now, would you use the Tikano to go to the village and uh, level down the entire village? But no, but if you can... If you can carry out your surveillance and intel very well, and then you discover the allocation in the forest, you can apply the Tucano. But you cannot apply the Tucano at all times. Yeah. So the issue basically is, are we fighting this terrorism with sincerity? Nigerians, those of them who are involved, you remember the case of the man in, in, in Niger State who kidnapped uh, school children and took them to the forest. And when, 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 when he released a statement, when they were threatening him, he said that all the plans and strategy the government was putting in place in Niger State, that he has a record of all the men who were brought into a, a, a Niger State from Abuja to come look for him in the forest. That he's up that the man who gave him the business, those were his words, was a part of those, was with those who are, are taking the decisions in, in Niger State. So mm -hmm. what are we talking about? For us to succeed, we must learn the act of the use of modern equipment to prosecute these wars. Yeah. We're talking about the Abuja Kaduna corridors now. Do we have surveillance uh, aircraft? Do we have unmanned aerial vehicles patrolling that area 247? If you have all of this, you can gather intel, you can do surveillance, and then the th those who will carry out the, the attack. We have been doing it, we have just been referring, uh, um, repelling them. You know, counter is what we've been doing. We've, have we been proactive? Have we been proactive? We wait for the terrorists to hit, and then we begin to go after them. Look at what happened at the airport, an airport like Kaduna, where terrorists had access into. We're not talking about some of the military bases where we know that they are, they are constant targets. You go to a gateway and then you, you hold on the, the people in that, on that gateway right. to ransom for a time. Yeah. Until government, the state governors must join hands together. The money they are receiving, they must bring it out to buy equipment for surveillance and intel gathering. Mm. So that at the end of the day, look, if you are able to achieve all of this, 50% you have won the war. Mm. All right. So le let me take it back to Zoom. And then we, we are actually coasting them because of our time. Uh, and I wanted to uh, address this based on the fact that the Cardinal State Governor, uh, Nasser Erufai, you know, mulled the idea of bringing in mercenaries to fight this terrorist. So do you think that's the way to go? Well, I always say that uh, the issues of, let me call them private military contractors, because when you give them automatically the name mercenaries, you want to close the debate. I think the issue of PMC should not be a closed one. We should examine the pros and cons. What do I mean? Most militaries, many militaries use PMCs. If you have challenges in your security and you think your own national forces can be able to solve it within a reasonable time, you don't need PMCs. If, on the other hand, you have challenges which you think your own military, your own security in its correct form, like Kupin and something, they have some gaps which you cannot fill within a short time, then I think PMC is a solution you could look at. There's nothing shameful about using PMCs. There's pragmatism in using PMCs if you think you have gaps. Now, having said that, what uh, His Excellency Dwayne Erofai said, 
what I would add there is that uh, it has uh, the wrong way of doing the right thing. Mm. If we are going to bring PMCs, it is the you know it is it is the it is the, the, the it is it is the work of the federal government because as far as the constitution is concerned, defense. defense, national defense, is that of federal government. It will not be good for states to bring PMCs. But I insist, looking at PMCs where we are now, short of numbers, short of equipment. Despite I know equipment is being bought, but are we even buying the right equipment? Are people not cheating in buying equipment? I want the government please look at that. But mm -hmm. while we agree, you know, there is no, 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 no problem in bringing a quick fix method. While we, while, while, while we replace our military, that is my opinion on that. All right. Thank you very kindly. Um, your final thoughts on this, very, sh very quickly, less than, let's say, in 30 seconds, what would you like to say? Well, uh, some of these governors, when they make statements, I think they really do not know uh, the essence and gravity of the statements they make, whether they are with this, the, state, the things they say they want to do are within their purview. Yeah. Exactly. Aerofy has made so many statements over time concerning this issue going on. Kaduna State, this crisis, did this start with this terrorist? Yeah. Kaduna State has had a crisis of war between the Hausas and the Fulanis over time. That matter has not been addressed. Yeah. Until that matter is addressed, I think the, the, the issue we are having in uh, uh, Kaduna, the Northwest, now will be who, who, that's the only way they can reduce it. All mm. of it with credit to terrorists, terrorists, terrorists. Are all of them actually done by the terrorists? Well, we hope that. I leave uh, that to, we, to, we, to His Excellency to respond absolutely. to. Absolutely. We, we hope that they, they give answers to your rhetorical question. Security consultant Dalitin tomorrow, thank you very kindly for your insights this morning. Thank and pleasure. also via Zoom, uh, has been a private security and defense consultant, Group Captain Sadiq Shehu. Thank you so much for your time.